Today, quantitative easing, a dangerous addiction. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and problem news with a distinctively Australian flavour. The UK Parliament has been running an inquiry into quantitative easing in the context of the Bank of England's operational independence, its accountability and the transparency of its decision making. The committee also examined the economic effects of quantitative easing, what risks are entailed, its distributional impacts and the future of the programme. And it's now released its first report titled Quantitative Easing a dangerous addiction? Question mark. The bank started using QE, a process whereby it creates money by buying government and corporate bonds back in 2009 during the global financial crisis under former Bank of England Governor Mervyn King. But since then, the bank has stepped up its use during the coronavirus pandemic. Like other central banks, the Bank of England has resorted to that mechanism, having cut interest rates which, of course, is its traditional tool close to zero. The stock of mostly government bonds rose through the decade before almost doubling in size since the onset of the coronavirus pandemic to about £840 billion now. That total is set to hit £895 billion by the end of 2021, when the Bank of England is due to complete its current round of purchases. The bank's direct contribution to ensuring a robust recovery has been to keep the printing presses rolling. And that emergency fix, which began back in the financial crisis more than a decade ago, has really become now a permanent feature of policy. And the £895 billion of bond buying will include $20 billion of corporate debt. And of course that has been helpful to the government as public sector borrowing has soared. And remember the latest consumer price inflation data, together with a surge in average weekly earnings, is now raising questions as to whether the last £150 billion of QE authorised in January should be completed. Much of the current bout of inflation can be attributed to known factors such as surging oil and fuel prices, supply bottlenecks as the world emerges from Covid, and souped up house and timber prices, the old base effects. And there are skills shortages in the labour market, which contributed to a 7.3% rise in average weekly earnings in the three months to May. At the last Monetary Policy Committee meeting back in May, former Chief Economist Andy Haldane proposed tapering by £50 billion. But he's now gone, though Deputy Governor Dave Ramsden and outside MPC member Michael Saunders are starting to get the heebie-jeebies about rising prices and want to engage the brakes. The two Bank of England policymakers said this week that the time for the Bank of England to start to ease off on its stimulus might be approaching as the economy bounces back from its nearly 10% crash last year and inflation rises further above its 2% target. But now the report from a Lord's Committee, the members of which include former Threadneedle Street Governor Mervyn King, said there was a threat of quantitative easing leading to higher inflation and causing damage to the government's finances. Michael Forsyth, the committee's chairman, said the Bank of England has become addicted to quantitative easing. It appears to be its answer to all the country's economic problems and by the end of 2021 the bank will own an eye-watering £875 billion of government bonds and £20 billion in corporate bonds. It is disturbing that the bank has been ineffective in explaining how quantitative easing helps us all. It is understandable that at times of distress, such as when Lehman collapsed in 2008 and in March 2020 when Covid caused panic, that flooding the system with cash was seen as a public good. But now Michael Forsyth says that the programme, which is equivalent to about 40% of British annual economic output, required more answers from the Bank of England about its effectiveness and its impact on wealth inequalities. The Bank of England must spell out more clearly why it is not reining in its huge stimulus 
in the face of rising inflation. And he asserts that there has been a big deficit in both scrutiny and accountability. The Bank of England has become addicted to quantitative easing. And Forsyth is a member, by the way, of Prime Minister Boris Johnson's Conservative Party. And the committee said, during the course of its inquiry, it had become apparent that the Bank of England was widely perceived to be using QE to finance the government's record peacetime budget deficit during the pandemic. The bank's bond purchases were aligned closely with the speed of issuance by HM Treasury, the Peers report said. If perceptions continue to grow that the bank is using QE mainly to finance the government's spending priorities, it could lose credibility, destroying its ability to control inflation and maintain financial stability. QE is a serious danger to the long-term health of the public finances. A clear plan on how QE will be unwound is necessary in this plan must be made public. Now, in response, the Bank of England said its purchases sought only to stabilise the economy and financial markets in line with its public mandate. It is wrong to suggest that the Monetary Policy Committee has pursued another policy, namely to finance the government's borrowing during the crisis, a BOE spokesman said. The evidence does not support this assertion, nor has the MPC ever suggested this was its policy. QE and the package of other measures announced over the past 18 months have lowered borrowing costs right across the economy, providing much needed support to all borrowers at a time of extreme economic stress. It is wrong to suggest that the MPC has produced another policy, namely to finance the government's borrowing during the crisis. The evidence does not support this assertion. Fourth, I said his committee had taken evidence from a range of experts from around the world, including former central bankers from the US Federal Reserve, the European Central Bank and the Bank of Japan. We found that central banks all over the world face comparable risks. QE is a serious danger to the long term health of the public finances. A clear plan on how QE will be unwound is necessary and this plan must be made public. Going forwards, the bank must be more transparent, justifying the use of QE and showing its workings. The bank needs to explain how it will curb inflation if it is more than just short term. It also needs to do more to mitigate widening wealth inequalities that have resulted from rising asset prices caused by QE. Now, Andrew Bailey's job as governor of the Bank of England was always going to become more difficult when the task of preserving financial stability clashed with the core responsibility of taming inflation. Bailey did a terrific job of preventing financial markets falling off a cliff edge at the outset of COVID and in supporting the government in preventing the economic scarring, which was widely feared. But Forsyth said the scale and persistence of QE, which of course is now equivalent to 40% of the economy's output, required the sort of significant scrutiny the bank had not faced up until now. Peers say that if the bank doesn't act to curb inflation now, it will be much more difficult to rein in later. The Bank of England risks becoming addicted to creating money and needs to come clean about how it plans to unwind its £895 billion bond buying programme. The House of Lords warned. And it's worth noting that the report highlighted the question of independence of the Bank of England and its relationship with Treasury. We sympathise with the Bank of England that it has had to meet its mandate in an economic environment in which its independence has been more difficult to define compared to when operational independence was granted in 1997, the report said. Dealing with the economic consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic means the bank necessarily worked more closely with HM Treasury to ensure policy is complementary. However, HM Treasury has not helped to clarify its relationship with the bank in its ambiguous answers to us. Furthermore, adding additional roles to the bank risks it losing focus on its primary responsibility to control inflation. Well, finally, at last, 
someone is asking the question which I have been asking for more than a year, which is how are you going to unwind all of this quantitative easing? And that question should be directed not just at the Bank of England, but all central banks, including the Reserve Bank here in Australia. And in terms of the Reserve Bank's relationship with the Treasury here, it is simply that same ambiguity. In fact, I would argue that the Reserve Bank here in Australia is in the precise to the same mode as the Bank of England, and it's lost its independent view. It has become, frankly, an instrument of government policy, and that is a very bad thing. So I think here in Australia, there should be a similar inquiry into quantitative easing, and severe questions need to be asked of the Reserve Bank here about how they're going to unwind quantitative easing, and making sure that we don't box ourselves into an ever-increasing cycle of QE, because the risk is they'll just go on doing it to try and support the government debt into the future. And that would be a very bad move because it would continue to inflate asset prices, be they home prices or be they stock market prices. And more importantly, it creates huge distortions in the economy, which means that our economy can't function as it should on its own terms. And the bottom line is this, just focusing on financial stability and supporting the financial system is not sufficient to bring the economy back to form. And I think central banks around the world have lost the plot. They are equating financial stability with the best interests of ordinary people. And unfortunately, that is just the wrong way to think about it. And I look forward to ongoing debate about how quantitative easing will be unwound. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.